And today we're going to begin our worship service with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Love for our work and our play, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood let us pray to the lord let us pray to the lord Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, tireless guardian of your people, you're always ready to hear our cries. Teach us to rely day and night on your care. Inspire us to seek your enduring justice for all the suffering world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The good news from the 8th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the scribes and the chief priests and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this quite openly. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today marks the halfway point of our sermon series through the Gospel of Mark. As we reach the eighth chapter, that is literally halfway through the Gospel of Mark. This is our sixth sermon series. We promised we were going to do 12 sermons on the Gospel of Mark. We are halfway there, and it is abundantly clear. At this point, thus far, nobody understands who Jesus is which is fairly disappointing because that's, of course, why we're reading the Gospel of Mark. We want to understand who Jesus is, but it is clear that of all the people who have met Jesus, none of them have a clue. In fact, most of the time when Jesus encounters people, he leaves them confused, he leaves them frustrated, sometimes he even leaves them frightened. Think about the stories we have heard thus far. When Jesus teaches parables, people are confused by them. When Jesus teaches about the law, people are frustrated by this, especially the religious leaders. And when Jesus does a miracle, people are sometimes even frightened of him. Some of you remember the story of the Gennesaret, the demonic possessed man who was made clean. That's the story with the 2,000 pigs. The people were so afraid of Jesus, they begged him to leave. Thus far through the Gospel of Mark, nobody But nobody understands who Jesus is. But finally, at the halfway point, everything changes. One person, one person finally figures it out. Jesus is hiking with the disciples. They stop to stay at the village of Caesarea Philippi. They are there when Jesus asks them an important question. Jesus turns to Peter, Andrew, James, John, the rest of the disciples, and he asks, who do people say that I am? Immediately, the disciples are like first graders during show and tell. Everyone's raising their hand. They can't wait to speak. In fact, before Jesus can even call on them, they begin shouting out the answers. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're one of the other prophets like Jeremiah or Isaiah or Hosea. Everybody wants to speak. Jesus Jesus nods his head. Of course, Jesus already knows what the crowds are saying about him. Jesus knows people think he's He's important that he's in the long line of prophets who can do these extraordinary things. Of course, Jesus is something more than this. So he asks the disciples, but who do you say that I am? I don't, I don't want to know about the crowds who've seen me for a few hours at a time. I want to know what you guys think. 
those of you who are with me day after day after day. And suddenly the disciples who moments ago were shouting out answers, now they are like me on a really cold night when my wife asks if I will take the dog out. Suddenly I just pretend like I don't hear anything. I sit there in silent, hopefully, hopefully, thinking maybe, just maybe she'll take the dogs out or she'll ask one of the kids to do it. Whatever you do, the disciples think, don't make eye contact with Jesus. Don't let Jesus call on you. But Jesus just sits there patiently until finally, finally, one of the disciples knows he has to speak. So Peter utters the words he has been contemplating for who knows how long. Who do you say that I am? Peter says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. Finally, eight chapters into the Gospel of Mark, somebody has figured it out. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, my hunch is Messiah is a word that we don't fully understand. It's one of those words that we know it shows up in the Bible, but perhaps we do not really understand what it, what it meant in Scripture. Uh, a brief description, Messiah literally means anointed one. There's a long-standing belief among the Hebrew people that one day God would send uh, a special messenger, God's anointed one, who would save the Hebrew people, who would save God's people. When Peter says Jesus is the Messiah, he's saying you're the one who was promised. Of course, of course, biblical scholars, and I don't want us to get lost in the weeds on this, but biblical scholars are quick to, to add, it's a little more complicated than this because in the first century, the Hebrew people, even those who believed the Messiah was coming, they really disagreed on what the Messiah was going to do. They, they disagreed on what the Messiah was going to save them from. For, for some people, they believed the Messiah would save them from Roman occupation. Others thought they would save the Hebrew people from the religious leaders who were taking advantage of them. Some thought they would be saved from evil. Some thought they would actually be saved from the high taxes and the, and the incredible large amounts of debt that the peasants owed to the landowners. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things people thought the Messiah would save them from. But those are just details. The important part is Peter gets the answer right. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God's anointed. Jesus is the Savior. And now, halfway through the Gospel of Mark, Peter knows, and you know, and I know, which means we kind of got it all figured out, right? I mean, I know it's only halfway, but it feels like we should kind of be done with the Gospel of Mark by now. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I like Mark's Gospel. Of all the Gospels, it's easily in my top four, but still, why oh, why are we going to finish? Why are we going to spend six more weeks on this? I mean, we already know Jesus is the Messiah. We already understand Jesus enough, don't we? Or, or do we? The next story would tell us that maybe, just maybe, we need to keep going. Because what happens is a moment after, and it, it can't get any closer, it is the very next verse. The moment after Jesus is declared the Messiah by Peter, Jesus explains what that means. He tells his followers... These are his closest friends about how the Messiah is going to suffer, how he's going to be rejected, and ultimately how he is going to die. The moment Jesus says this, Peter says, Jesus, we, we need to talk. Peter, who just confessed Jesus as the Messiah, pulls Jesus aside and the scripture tells us he begins to rebuke Jesus. Do, do you understand what this means? Jesus, we can't be having any of this stuff. You're the Messiah. This is not how saviors are supposed to talk. That's, that's how losers talk, Jesus. Rejection, suffering, death. Nobody's going to sign up for that, Jesus. You're the Messiah. You need to be talking about, about winning. You need to be talking about, about, about defeating your enemies, about conquering those who disagree with you. Come on, Jesus. That's what we've signed up for. That's what the Messiah is supposed to do. Do, do you understand the problem? Peter is half right. Peter's got the right word. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is God's anointed. But Peter doesn't know what that actually means for his life. Peter is half right. People of God, there is some danger in being half right. Because for Peter, what that means is that he loves the Jesus who does the miracles. He loves the Jesus who has the power to heal people, but he wants nothing to do with the Jesus who actually bleed on a cross for his people. 
Peter loves the Jesus who walks on water. He will follow that Jesus to the ends of the earth. But the Jesus who's going to walk up the hill of Golgotha with a cross on his shoulders, Peter wants nothing to do with that Jesus. What Peter is soon going to discover, however, is that you can't have one without the other. It's not enough to just say that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Savior, if you're not willing to follow Jesus where Jesus actually goes. Peter wants Jesus to win. Peter wants Jesus to conquer his enemies. Peter wants Jesus to destroy those who disagree with him. That's not who Jesus is. And that's what we discover in the last half of the Gospel of Mark. To follow Jesus, to truly follow Jesus, we have to go where Jesus leads us. And what we discover is that for Jesus, winning comes through losing, losing his life. That Jesus conquers death by dying. That Jesus destroys his enemies by loving them and turning them into his brothers and sisters in Christ. The great temptation for Christians in the 21st century is to follow Jesus, the Jesus we like, the Jesus who conforms to the image that we want in a Messiah, the Jesus who destroys, the Jesus who conquers, the Jesus who always wins. People of God, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who calls us into a life that frankly, sometimes, sometimes it looks like losing that rather than conquering our enemies, sometimes, sometimes we listen to them and we most certainly always love them. Jesus calls us into a life that isn't always about us, that instead it's about putting the concerns and needs of others first. Jesus calls into us to a life, not where we take care of ourselves and hoard as much as possible, but instead it's about using our resources to be a blessing to others. People of God, we are called to follow Jesus, not the Jesus we want, not the Messiah that we expect, or the Savior that conforms to our image. We are expected to continue to follow the Jesus who is, the Jesus who ultimately goes to the cross and calls us to follow him. May we do just that. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of creation, 
We pray for this hurting earth. Awaken in us a new desire to care for this world and empower us to support agencies, organizations, and individual efforts to care for our environment. Lord, in your mercy. God of all nations, we pray for our local, state, and federal governments. Help all our elected officials. Bless them with wisdom, humility, and a desire to serve. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, grant us a grace to grow deeper in our respect of and care for your creation. Help us to recognize the sacredness of all your creatures as signs of your wondrous love. Help us turn from the selfish consumption of resources meant for all and to see the impacts of our choices on the poor and the vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, today we pray for all those in need, including Mary Stenslin, Jan Borgen, Barb Steffenhagen, Dorothy Jogish, Beth Snyder, Vicki Curtis, Barbara Ragoni, Marilyn Johnson, and for all those who mourn, including the families of Tom McNerland and Hannah Keel, surround them with your grace and with your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.